Friends, never have I come across a more complex text than the one we have before us today. And let's be honest, the Bible is full of moments where we find ourselves puzzled and wondering what exactly it is we just read. Let's just agree at the very beginning of this moment that reading the Bible isn't always easy. And sometimes after we finish reading, we find ourselves more confused than when we started out. Am I right? So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let me also add the disclaimer that I love the Bible. I enjoy the stories. I look forward to the surprising ways God often chooses to speak. But the truth is, sometimes its complexities are difficult to grasp. But I'd like to propose something to you all this morning. I'd like to suggest that for a moment, you imagine yourself as any of the three figures in the text. Jesus, the disciples, and the crowd. Jesus, who is overwhelmed with compassion. The disciples, who are overwhelmed with justice fatigue. And the crowd, who is overwhelmed with need. Perhaps at this very moment, you are feeling like Jesus. You see the great needs around you. You are overwhelmed with compassion. You really, really want to help and you'll sacrifice your own sleep to make sure somebody else gets fed. Or maybe you're feeling like the disciples this morning. You've dedicated so much of your time and energy to feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, and you're currently overwhelmed with justice fatigue. You are exhausted from doing great things. You are worn out from your many acts of service and you are empty from constantly having to pour out for everyone else around you. But maybe you don't feel like Jesus or the disciples. Maybe this morning you're feeling more like the crowd and you're overwhelmed with need. Maybe you've been dealing with some issue for quite some time and all you want is a moment to experience the healing touch of Christ. And with passion and excitement and urgency, you are running as fast as you can to get to him. But whether you find yourself in the position of Jesus, the disciple, or the crowd, there's something interesting in all of this that makes our passage so complex for me. You see, our passage is not actually told from the perspective of any of these characters in the story. Instead, we are presented with an eyewitness account of all that is taking place, and we are finding it difficult to sort through. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that reads this passage and wonders, okay, so what exactly am I supposed to get out of this? But you see, it's becoming more and more apparent to me that even in our own lives, who tells the story makes a difference. The person with control of the narrative literally has the power in that moment to control how we understand what's happening. You see, presented to us this morning is a pericope of scripture that starts off in an awkward place. Then it cuts off right before the exciting part, and then it picks back up later with the most unusual plot twist I have ever seen. Before we arrive at verse 30, this sixth chapter of Mark actually begins with Jesus's rejection by his very own people in the town of Nazareth is then followed by his commissioning of the disciples two by two to go out and put into practice all that they have been taught. It's then followed by the tragic death of John the Baptist and the disciples' burial of their dear friend. And then when we arrive at verse 30, suddenly Jesus is back in the picture. He's greeted by the disciples who have great news about all the things that they've done, but recognizing their exhaustion, he invites them to come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. According to this eyewitness, the crowd sees them headed in another direction, rushes with urgency to meet them there, arrives before Jesus and the disciples, and what follows doesn't actually appear to be a period of rest at all. Instead, Jesus and the disciples feed 5,000 people 
with what started out as two fish and five loaves. And only after the feast has ended does Jesus send the disciples ahead of him to Bethsaida before he himself goes up on the mountain to pray. What began with come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while turns into the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and then Jesus and the disciples being met yet again by crowds of people who needed to experience his healing. Talk about a plot twist. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Yet disruption, interruption, and unexpected change happens. And what began as a journey to get away and rest turns into something completely different. But we can all relate to that too, can't we? We endure an extremely busy week. We find ourselves approaching our day off and then suddenly life happens. We are met with, seri with a series of disruptions, interruptions, and unexpected change. And what began as a day off or an afternoon off, maybe even a week off, turns into something completely different. For some of us, we have finally retired from our careers and anticipate relaxation, flexible schedules, and a whole lot of rest. And then suddenly, reality kicks in. We're met with more obligations than we had before. We are consistently interrupted by the needs of those around us. And we don't really have as much control over our days as we anticipated. These are the plot twists of this thing called life. It starts one way, but then ends another. So friends, naturally we approach our biblical story for this morning and we're stuck asking this question. If Jesus promised rest, why didn't he just send the crowds away and give the disciples the time alone they needed? Or maybe we find ourselves asking this question instead. If the period of rest promised wasn't actually provided, how then do we find meaning and purpose and power within this story? Hear these words by American writer and theologian, Frederick Buechner. Life itself can be thought of as an alphabet by which God graciously makes known God's presence and purpose and power among us. Buechner goes on to write, like the Hebrew alphabet, the alphabet of grace has no vowels. And in that sense, God's words to us are always veiled subtle, cryptic, so that it is left to us to delve their meaning, to fill in the vowels for ourselves by means of all the faith and imagination we can muster. In other words, the meaning we are in search of becomes clear and effective in our lives only when we flush it out ourselves, only when we set aside the eyewitness account and interpret things on our own. We're empowered to pull back the veil, to reveal what's been hidden, and to bring clarity to what seems puzzling. We're encouraged, friends, to consider that perhaps in the face of the veiled, subtle, and cryptic words of this text, that we need to do the work to delve their meaning and to fill in the vowels. But to do so, we have to utilize all the faith and all the imagination we can muster. In other words, Beekner is encouraging us to tap into our own faith journeys, to channel our creative imaginations, and to consider for a moment that perhaps we all have what it takes to find meaning in what appears to be a plot twist. In other words, if we imagine this story being told from the perspective of any of the characters in the story, I think we'd hear it a little differently. Why don't we consider for a moment the perspective of Jesus? I imagine Jesus saying it this way, I have spent some time with my disciples training and teaching them how to teach, heal, and serve others. I have sent them out two by two with specific instructions for how to carry with them all that they have learned. When we are reunited, I see on their faces and hear in their voices that they are overwhelmed with fatigue. They have poured out our weak in body and feel ill-equipped for what lies ahead. 
So I invite them to come away to a deserted place and rest a while. Yet this time I go with them. I get onto the boat with them and when we arrive and find that the crowds have already gathered, I take compassion on them and begin to teach them many things. I end up giving my good friends a break from having to handle the crowds all alone. And in the process of feeding some of our neighbors, my disciples get fed too. By the end of this leg of the journey, all who were present were restored, refreshed, recharged. And that includes my disciples too. You see, when I commanded them to come away with me to a deserted place and rest, I was letting them know that they weren't going in their own strength and power. I was here to experience the road with them. And friends, that is the first point of purpose, power, and meaning in our passage for this morning. It is because the disciples are in the company of Jesus that the task for the day is fulfilled. It is because they are no longer broken down into pairs but are back in the company of the whole group that they're able to accomplish so much. It is because we are more perfect together than we are apart that we're able to do more good. It's because we have each other to lean on that we're able to get through what appears to be difficult and impossible moments. In the presence of friends and those stronger than we might be in certain moments, we are able to accomplish so much more than we would be able to do alone. And I think that's a powerful reminder for those of us like myself who like to do everything alone and often need a reminder that it is okay to rely on others. And yet, friends, for a moment, we still have to return to the question we asked a little while ago. If Jesus promised rest, why didn't he send the crowds away and give the disciples the alone time they needed? Well, what if the promise for rest is actually fulfilled in this text? What if in hearing the story told from Jesus' perspective, we gain a different understanding of this thing called rest? What if it's in the decision to come and to go that we all find rest? You see, when I read our passage for this morning, I hear a very present and active command by Jesus to his disciples. Come away with me to a deserted place by yourselves and rest. Come and rest. Arrive by movement and be at ease. In the course of progress, refresh yourself. Come away with me to a deserted place by yourselves and rest. Friends, if we miss this, we'll continue to find ourselves struggling to find meaning and purpose and power in the midst of everything that's happening around us. Consider this. If Jesus promised rest at the beginning of the passage, and in the end, all who touched Jesus were healed, then I believe that it's on the journey itself that we really experience rest. In order to get from one point to the next, from one obligation to the next, from one crowd to the next, the disciples had to travel. They have to physically move in order to get where they are going. And perhaps when Jesus promises them a chance to rest, not only is he saying, I'm here to help carry the burden, but he silently states that we must never forsake or overlook those periods of transition. Because in the transition, you get to collect yourself. You get to pause for a moment just to breathe. You get to process all that has just taken place and then gear up for what's coming. And when you arrive at your next destination, you are then recharged for whatever charge it is you will face. And that is the same promise that is available to all of us. If we think differently about our moments in the car to and from our various destinations, if we become more sensitive to the time we have in between appointments to just catch our breath, if we remember that there's always a transition from point A to point B, then I think we'll find the rest and relief we're searching for. That is the real plot twist. In what appears to be a broken promise or a day full of disruptions, we actually return to the invitation to come and to rest. We get to journey on to the next thing, the next place, the next obligation. And in actively moving, 
in that period of transition, in the journey itself, we are refreshed. Friends, that's what it means to be recharged for the charge. It's to consider that on your journey, you will encounter moments of transition that will allow you to just pause and hit reset, just in time for you to arrive at your next appointment. But I think we had to read the story from a slightly different perspective in order to hear that message. And that's okay, how you tell the story makes a difference. If you focus only on the events that happen, you'll miss what took place in the middle. If you focus only on one character in the story, you'll leave out other important groups of people too. If you focus only on what you expected to happen, you'll miss what really happened in the text. All of that is a part of the story too. Now, a couple of months ago, some of you sat with me in our April discipleship class, and we watched a TED talk on the danger of the single story. Novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie shares in this compelling conversation that our lives and our cultures are composed of many overlapping stories. She warns that if we hear only a single story about another person or country or event, that we risk a critical misunderstanding. She challenges us, friends, to consider the entire story, the other perspectives, the things not always said or revealed to us at face value, because only then do we actually grasp the full picture. So is the case with scripture, and so is the case on this journey we call life. There's always another side to the story being told. May we feel empowered as we go throughout this week to embrace those moments of transition, no matter how brief they might be. May we accept Jesus' invitation to come and to rest, to reset and recharge while still in motion so that we might be better able to do all that we have been called and commanded to do. May we be encouraged to see the veiled, the subtle, and the cryptic, and to find meaning with all of the faith and all of the imagination that we can muster. Friends, may we be reminded to see and to hear the story from a different perspective in our search for purpose and power and meaning. May it be so. Amen.